after a century of germination, a remarkable lotus-shaped temple has blossomed in the heart of India. Attracting more than two million visitors a year, rivaling the Eiffel Tower and the Taj Mahal, the new temple welcomes people of all races, all religions, all cultures, and all classes. It is the Baha'i House of Worship, Mashrikal Askar. Architectural critics acclaimed it to be a major achievement, one of the most outstanding contemporary structures in the world, one of the most remarkable achievements of our time, as one of the masterpieces of the 20th century. Hello, welcome to Baha'i On Air. My name is Diane Scott. Today we have a really interesting guest with us, Mr. Fred Badian. Welcome, Fred. Thank you. Nice to be here. Mr. Badian is a film producer of many, many years' experience. He's worked on many films and he's fully produced a number of others. One of the ones he's produced has got some very, very special features. It's called Jewel in the Lotus. The Lotus, as you will probably know, is a flower that is well known in India. And this film is set in India. We'll talk to Mr. Badian about the making of the film shortly, but first, let's take a look at the film. India, a land of rich cultural heritage. Its people steeped in traditions of ancient and diverse faiths. Indian life, Indian art, and perhaps most of all, Indian architecture display the diverse panoply of significant and powerful symbols, expressive of the innermost life of the spirit of man. Symbols that unite man with his creator. Symbols that have often separated him from his fellow man. Four hundred years ago, Shah Akbar, the greatest of the Mughal emperors, from his magnificent palace near Agra, dreamed of uniting all the diverse people of India under the banner of one universal faith. Well, I dreamed that stone by stone, I reared a sacred fane, a temple, neither pagode, mosque, nor church, but loftier, simpler, always open door to every breath from heaven. And truth and peace and love and justice came and dwelt therein. But such a goal remained far beyond the reach of even the most powerful emperor. In 1880, Jamal Effendi sailed to Bombay, bringing the Baha'i faith, the teachings of Baha'u'llah, to the Indian subcontinent. The Baha'i faith, newest of the world's major religions, proclaimed the underlying spiritual unity of the diverse peoples and religions of humankind. The impending fulfillment of Akbar's dream, a truly universal religion. Through the next 100 years, the Baha'i community grew, developing the foundations of religious unity. The young Baha'i community longed to build a unique temple that all the people of India could recognize as their own. After a century of germination, a remarkable lotus-shaped temple has blossomed in the heart of India. Attracting more than two million visitors a year, rivaling the Eiffel Tower and the Taj Mahal, the new temple welcomes people of all races, all religions, all cultures, and all classes. It is the Baha'i House of Worship Mashrikal Askar, the dawning place of the mention of God. It is an achievement of the human spirit, marking the conclusion of the first century of the Baha'i faith in the Indian subcontinent a new embodiment of an ancient symbol. This remarkable structure has been widely hailed as one of the most outstanding architectural achievements of this generation. 
The Times of London called it the Taj Mahal of the 20th century. Its design is a unique blend of today's most advanced technologies with traditional craftsmanship. In its structure is the labor and commitment of the people of India. In its concept is a unity embodied in a symbol that lies at the heart of India's spiritual heritage, the lotus flower. The temple itself reflects qualities of the community that built it. Followers of Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. In just over a century, this young faith has spread throughout the planet, reconciling ancient religious beliefs with the knowledge and needs of today, proclaiming the oneness of God, the oneness of religion, the oneness of all humanity. In 1974, the world governing body of the Baha'i faith, the Universal House of Justice, called for designs for the first Baha'i temple of the Indian subcontinent. 28-year-old architect Farabor Sapa traveled to India in search of inspiration for such a monumental project. I began traveling without any preconception, searching for ideas. I visited many places all over India, not for architectural research, but to search for a concept. I was hoping to discover some secret to find the spiritual guidance. Symbolism has great significance in India, probably more than anywhere else I know. Everything has meaning and every symbol speaks in a way to the hearts of the people. In a small city of, of India, I met a man, an ordinary Baha'i, who came to, who knew, who has heard that I, I am going to design about the temple and this. So he came to me and um, he just, he was curious about what I'm going to do and all of these things. And then he, for the first time, he mentioned to me the lotus. I was impressed by his enthusiasm, but the concept itself did not attract me. Yet, as I returned to travel, everywhere I went, I saw the lotus in front of me. I could not escape from it this concept. I was seeing it everywhere. The lotus, perhaps the most ancient religious symbol in this ancient land, springing from the beginning which hath no beginning. The early Vedas state that this blossom was born of the light of the constellations. Ancient Brahmanic myths identify the lotus as the first living thing to emerge from the primordial sea, the starting point for the evolution of all created things. In the Hindu epic poem, the Mahabharata, the creator Brahma is described as having sprung from the lotus that grew out of Lord Vishnu's navel. According to Buddhist traditions, the Bodhisattva was born from a lotus and is often portrayed seated upon a lotus pedestal holding a lotus in his hand. Variations on this theme are common not only throughout India, but abroad from Java to Tibet, from China and Japan to Central Asia. It is a symbol of the universal Buddha, Maitreya, a sign of the manifestation of God. Buddhists glorify him in their prayers, O Mani Padme Hom, yea, O jewel in the lotus, the lotus also finds expression in Zoroastrian, Christian, and Islamic traditions. Now, the lotus came to be embodied in the bold and creative design for the Baha'i Temple. All the people in all the religions, uh, they have accepted lotus as a unique symbol of uh, spiritual, spirituality, purity, and it represents the messengers of God. Mr. Sahba's drawings describe a remarkable structure. Three rolls of nine petals, each spring from a podium, which elevates the building above the surrounding plain. The first two rows curve inward, embracing the inner dome, rising to 34 meters. 
the middle set of petals reaches more than 22 meters, some 70 feet into the air. The third layer curves outward to form canopies over the nine entrances. The diameter across the entrance petals is 70 meters, 230 feet. The main load of the building is borne by nine large archways, which frame the central auditorium. The main building is surrounded by nine pools of water, whose shape suggests the floating leaves of the lotus. The central circular auditorium seats 1,200 people with the ability to accommodate an additional 1,000. The entire superstructure functions as a series of skylights, allowing light into the central hall the same way light passes through the petals of a lotus flower. The new temple in India joins the distinguished company of the high houses of worship on every continent. All share certain design elements, the nine-sided structure, a central dome, interiors bathed in natural light, symbolic of unity and the light of divine guidance. Yet each is unique, expressive of the cultural heritage of its own area. Mr. Sapa's breathtaking design was readily accepted, but his unusual concept presented a formidable engineering problem. How do you create a large, structurally sound building that still captures the delicate natural form of the lotus. To tackle the problem of structural design, Mr. Sapa chose the Flint and Neal Partnership of London as structural consultants. The most uh, important uh, aspect of the development of the design was the, uh, hinged on the use of uh, modern computing techniques. In 1978, when Mr. Saber and we first got together, that we had a new generation of computer software, um, which was vastly more powerful than anything we'd had before. The architectural and engineering teams worked closely together over an 18-month period. Consultation helped them achieve unity between the design and structural requirements. The final design was almost identical to the architect's original drawings. Bold and daring, a lattice of thin concrete shells without supporting beams, delicate, like an eggshell, drawing strength almost totally from their shape. Freestanding petals, complex curves and arches, utterly impossible to build without the most advanced technology. Yet Indian construction techniques are labor intensive, with minimal equipment and time-worn methods. A leading British architect commented at the time, to build such a structure in Europe would be extremely difficult. In India, impossible. At the site, work began early in 1978. Mr. Sapa shifted his office from London to assemble the construction team, assuming the additional role of project manager. The project recruited up to 800 people, most of whom would live at the site over much of the next six years. In an unprecedented move, the project established a school providing education and child care so parents could work nearby without anxiety. The workers came from all parts of India, people of different regions, different languages, different faiths. Women workers removed hundreds of tons of earth and rock from the extensive excavations and carried the concrete from much of the structure. Each woman walked an estimated 21 kilometers per day, carrying as much as 20 tons of material in an eight-hour shift. Once the basement and podium were constructed, the nine massive supporting arches were completed. Then the extraordinary process of creating the shells began. Construction of a shell structure of such size and complexity had never been attempted anywhere in the world, and many engineers considered it a practical impossibility. Architect, designers, and contractors engineers conducted months of research and experimentation to find innovative approaches and develop workable new building techniques. Experimental models were built out of timber, 
patterns were created for the formwork that would shape the cement petals. New concreting techniques had to be developed. For aesthetic and structural reasons, Mr. Safa was determined to avoid construction joints in the shells. This required finding a way to pour the thin 13 centimeter shells up to 22 meters high in one continuous operation. This was more than 10 times the maximum height of pour recommended by the consultants. Pouring to such heights and compacting concrete in the narrow forms, which for some shells was no more than seven centimeters wide and curved in two directions, posed the most formidable challenge. Months of consultation finally produced a complex plan requiring the precise coordination of some 300 workers at a time, working rapidly, precisely, and continuously for periods of up to 48 hours. As concreting commenced, the outer formwork was put in position one row at a time. To compact the concrete, needle vibrators were threaded into pre-planned positions by workers standing on platforms 10 meters above the pouring level, step by step. With the coordinated efforts of hundreds of hands, the delicate concrete petals grew skyward. Meanwhile, teams of workers were systematically pouring over the steel frame, tightening any nuts worked loose by the constant vibration. This complex operation had to proceed flawlessly and without interruption through multiple shift changes. In spite of scorching heat, torrential monsoon rains, high winds, equipment breakdowns, and frequent power outages. You can say 300 people are working at a time on these platforms, and uh, they talk in 10 different languages. Uh, we came uh, together, and we worked like absolute members of one family. Working because you are living together, you are working around the clock. And every night, this concreting of these shells has been done in all in one, one piece, one, one go. Uh, 48 hours has taken to complete one of these shells. The hundreds of workers developed a spirit of reverence about their work. Arriving workers often performed a brief puja, or prayer, before beginning their work. Together with the tons of dolomite aggregate and pure white silica sand, these workers poured something of the soul of India into this structure. As the shells were completed, the pattern of the lotus began to emerge. The inner leaves in groups of three, the outer and entrance leaves in proper sequence to maintain an even loading on the structure. Once the outer and entrance petals were completed, work began on the final and most difficult part of the construction, the inner petals of the interior dome a delicate lattice of nine intersecting shells just seven centimeters thick. With every step, every process, every day, the work of these hundreds of men and women met world-class standards. The inner surfaces were bush hammered by some 100 workers harnessed to platforms at dangerous heights, removing a thin layer of concrete to expose the aggregate. One can say easily, its entire project is a handicraft because of uh, the, uh, all the uh, items which have been uh, done with the uh, help of people that they are really craftsmen, like 400 carpenters at a time, making 40,000 square meter of formwork, something like this, or bush hammering of hundreds of, uh, you can say, near about 9,000 square meter bush hammering uh, with the help of chisel and a sort of just a small hammer and chisel by hand. This sort of work that that, that feeling was developed at site that everybody has something to contribute. And that was the spirit of teamwork that we, uh, that could really do this job in India. This spirit of unity, transcending culture, race, language, and faith, was critical to the project during the long years of construction. The external structure was covered with Grecian marble from Mount Pentelicon, the same marble used on the Parthenon of ancient Athens and the monumental buildings at the Baha'i World Center. In Chiampo, Italy, 
Some of the world's finest marble artisans shape the curved marble covering. Using full-scale mock-ups and computer-controlled saws, the Italian craftsmen labored for two and one-half years to mold the marble to the subtle, elegant lines of the lotus. The marble was suspended over the concrete shells by stainless steel anchors, a cladding system never before used in India. More than 10,000 pieces of curved marble, each of a different size, had to be fitted together like the pieces of a giant three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. The challenge of the project produced story after moving story of great personal sacrifice, as Baha'is from throughout India, Baha'is from throughout the world, often gave whatever they had to help the work proceed. In Iran, hundreds of Baha'is imprisoned for their allegiance to this gentle faith worked within the prison walls in order to be able to make their contribution to the temple project. To them was to go the honor of contributing the crowning jewel in the temple. On December 22, 1986, just two days before the final dedication, this centerpiece, bearing a calligraphic rendering symbolizing the unity of God, the unity of all religions, and the unity of all mankind, the name of Baha'u'llah was set like a precious jewel in the heart of the lotus. For Baha'is, such sacrificial acts evoke memories of the suffering of Baha'u'llah. A small cachet containing dust gathered from his shrine was cemented beneath the marble above the majestic archway facing the Holy Land. According to the teachings of Baha'u'llah, faith must be expressed in selfless deeds. For the Baha'i community, the completed temple stands as a witness to the spiritual oneness of all religions and to their commitment to build a peaceful and united world. Some 10,000 Baha'is from more than 70 countries flock to the dedication ceremonies to inhale the fragrance of the lotus and celebrate their achievement. Ravi Shankar, India's world-renowned musical genius, composed music for the dedication. Architectural critics acclaimed it to be a major achievement, one of the most outstanding contemporary structures in the world, one of the most remarkable achievements of our time, as one of the masterpieces of the 20th century. Yet perhaps the most important reaction came not from the experts, but from the multitude of people of every religion, every race, and every nation who come to visit. Thousands come every day, drawn by the beauty, drawn as if by an invisible spirit, drawn to prayer and meditation. मैं सत्य कहता हूँ कि the utterance of God is a lamp whose light is these words. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. So powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. Mashrikal Askar, the dawning place of the mention of God. 
the Lotus of Bahapur. Now let's talk to Fred Badiam, the maker of that wonderful film. Fred was born in Iran, but as a young man he went to the United States. And ever since he's been there, he's worked in the film industry. Fred, it's been a few years now since the temple was built. How do you think the people of India feel about the temple? What is their response to the temple? It's the people of India, first of all, they feel all of them. This is their temple. Muslim, Christian, Hindu, many, many religions, they come. They literally come to the house of worships of India, Jewel Lotus, and they pray there. And this thing is, is, I found out why, because the children, since they are a little uh, child, as they come and go in the school, they, any temple they find, they go and pray. They are so in Indian people they are very, very spiritual people. Secondly, also, the house of worship of India, when, when it was built, was the third place of the number of the visitor that they would go visit. First was Eiffel Tower, then was the Taj Mahal, the third was the House of Worship India. Past four or five years has been past that number. Million, millions people go every month. They come second in the world. First is the Eiffel Tower, and second is the House of Worship in India, and third is Taj Mahal. Uh, other aspects is, I was mentioning, that is the, to show the best pictures of the uh, house of worships I had to be creative I have to work at it so we rent a, a fire truck and this fire trucks with a ladder that we climb up we were able to go in the way in the top of the uh, fire truck ladder and get a lot of the magnificent beautiful shot from above that we could capture all the nine pedals around the uh, house of Worships uh, around this uh, lotus. It was absolutely beautiful and so colourful. Those women doing such heavy work and dressed in such beautiful clothes at the same time. You know, in the West we're not used to seeing women doing this kind of heavy work. That is a custom of the, yes. typical custom of the India. Yes, it was just lovely watching that. That is the woman with the baby in the back and carrying all those big rocks or a cement and continuously coming back and forth. Thank you Fred for joining us today on Baha'i On Air. It was really such a pleasure listening to you, sharing with us about the making of this wonderful video. Thank you and it is a pleasure to be a part of this. Thank you. And thank you for joining us.